Well, good afternoon, folks. We're going to get started in just a couple of moments here. Let people uh, filter in. So give me just one moment. Thanks for joining us. I still see the number going up, so I'm still going to delay our start just a moment. I hope it's not uh, storming where you are. I know several of us are experiencing a good old thunderstorm right now, and one of our panelists may have to deal with that crisis. Hopefully not. <laughs> Well, that looks like we're just about at critical mass. So I'll uh, do a quick intro and then we'll, we'll get rocking and rolling. So again, my name is uh, Ted Brady. I am the executive director for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, but today my role is to be a facilitator of a great conversation with our panelists to talk about uh, infrastructure. And uh, just to put this in perspective, uh, you know, the Vermont proposition talks about infrastructure quite a bit, whether you realize it or not. Uh, the, the, there's three specific bullets that I'd like to bring everybody's attention to, uh, part one, which really is uh, the, the paramount thing for infrastructure in this proposition is talking about broadband and ensuring affordable high-speed broadband and cellular access for all Vermonters while using digital tools to promote community connection and democracy. Uh, also, uh, part three, talking about advancing creative solutions to climate change. Uh, it's going to take significant infrastructure investments to make that happen, whether it be transportation, electric and energy, uh, or potentially C part one broadband. And then the third, uh, the third one that I just want to point out is in the proposition already is part six, which says that Vermont must strengthen business, entrepreneurship, investment, workforce, and rural innovation. All of that is built on the backs of some sort of infrastructure. And I think we're gonna have a conversation today about what that definition is, but really I wanna frame it for everybody. The, con the conversation today is really about what, how does infrastructure play a role in the Vermont proposition, either in those three bullets we just uh, learned about or some other way, because this is our chance to influence the Vermont proposition. So a couple of quick housekeeping rules. <clears throat> just a reminder that you can turn on or turn off closed captioning. You can do that down below in, the, uh, in your Zoom function. Uh, and if you have a question you'd like to ask, we're doing a fishbowl today, which means I'm going to spend about half this time uh, peppering our panelists with questions, and then we're going to turn it over for about half the time to you to ask questions. And if you don't ask questions, I'm going to have to ask more questions. So please enter your questions in the Q&A as we're going. Don't feel like you need to wait until the end to do so. And we'll go, we'll go do that. Do that in the Q&A function in Zoom. If you want to say hi to your friend, Tell John Tracy, uh, you know, what a great guy he is. Do that in the chat function. But if you have a question, do it in the Q&A function. So with that, oh, I should also thank Victoria Rust, who's behind the scenes managing the tech for us. With that, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. I uh, give them each two minutes to do so. A quick, simple intro. Tell us where you're from. Tell us uh, where you work, what, what kind of work you do, and really why you care about the Vermont proposition. And I'm going to start it off with uh, our Secretary of Commerce, Lindsay Curley. Great. Thank you so much, Ted. It's so nice to be with all of you this afternoon. My name is Lindsay Curley. I'm the Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Many of you know that Ted and I used to be uh, wingmen, wing, <laughs> wing partners. Um, and it's really nice to be reunited with you today, uh, Ted. Um, I've been the secretary for nearly three years now, and six months after I was appointed, we found ourselves facing a once-in-a-century pandemic. I will be honest with you that taking this role, I was prepared to be an advocate for Vermont's businesses, our economy, and our communities, though I would say that recovery and resiliency meant something really different before the pandemic to me. The Vermont proposition very much aligns with the goals of the Scott administration to recover from the pandemic and for Vermont to be better than we were when we started, to utilize this unprecedented influx of dollars and funding to equitably provide communities with the tools to recover in a sustained and resilient way, and to invest in ways that provide for transformational renewal in Vermont. So with that, I'll hand it back to Ted. Thanks, Lindsay. And I'm gonna introduce, or at least uh, invite Laura Sebelia, Representative Laura Sebelia to introduce herself. Thanks, Ted. Uh, Representative Laura Sebelia, uh, I serve 
on the Energy and Technology Committee in the House of Representatives. I'm also a mom of three. I live in Dover and have been on the school board for almost 20 years. It's just about retirement time, I think. Uh, I also um, work outside of the session in regional economic development. And in that job, we think a lot about um, recovery and resilience um, and renewal for Vermont in our rural corner of the state and uh, how we address uh, things like demographics, uh, climate change issues, and now the pandemic. And so, you know, I have watched uh, over the years as my neighbors and rural communities have really struggled and slipped further and further behind, but I've also watched um, Vermonters in my neck of the woods and uh, as a state representative with a viewpoint around the state um, you know, Vermonters around around our state come together um, and uh, with no fear, really willing to take on uh, the biggest challenges. Uh, and so I really care about the Vermont proposition because it comes from Vermonters and, uh, you know, that's that's how we will get it done. So and I'm really excited to be here today. Thanks, Representative Sebelia. And uh, how about you, Mary? Uh, tell us about yourself and why you care about the proposition. Thank you, Ted. Hi, everyone. Mary McClure. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Green Mountain Power. Uh, I've been in this role uh, for about a year and a half, so similar to Secretary Curley, uh, right around the time the pandemic was starting. Uh, but I've been with the company for um, a little over a decade. So um, I'm just thrilled to be here today and be a part of the summit uh, and this panel in particular. Um, as I was hearing you uh, open TED and read through the three bullets. I thought about um, how connectivity and uh, resilience in particular are not new words to Vermont, uh, but my goodness, they have taken on such incredible meaning in our lives uh, over the last year, and, and they no doubt are critical to our recovery as a state um, and really the reinvention of Vermont as the best place to live and work. Um, what I enjoyed the most about the draft proposition is that it recognizes um, the important turning point we are at um, from Vermonters themselves, as Representative Sebelia pointed out. Um, it's a critical time in our history to improve uh, life in our communities, advance equity, uh, and really build a more sustainable economy. And I personally really feel that turning point happening. Um, so I think I think as uh, we think about our future selves and future Vermonters, uh, I hope we look back over this time period, um, recognize it as a critical moment, and, and I hope our future selves find just a lot of collaboration uh, resulting in some great strategic decisions that advance the state uh, to one that's highly connected uh, and, and highly resilient. So thanks again. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Mary. God, we're lucky to have you where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, John Tracy, fire away. Well, good afternoon. I'm John Tracy. I'm Senator Lee, State Director. I work out of Burlington. I was born and raised in Springfield, Vermont. I still have a family home there. In fact, I was just down in Springfield last weekend, and the Vermont vision that we're working on, when I see a town, when I grew up, it was incredibly vibrant. The machine tool industry was alive and well. People were traveling from all over the world, and to go back there and see where it's a town like so many of Vermont trying to regain some structure and there's incredible potential there. I also served 12 years in the state legislature where I was able to work with a lot of people throughout the state of Vermont. I love that experience because like this endeavor, it is people going to that building really trying to make a difference. You know, they have different perspectives, but if you respect that, they're really trying to make a difference in people's lives. And we do have a great opportunity here. The federal resources that are coming in as a result of the CARES Act, and the American Rescue Plan, it presents us with some funding opportunities we would not have, release some pressures on the general fund of the state budget. And having been on a number of community visits as a member of the VCRD board, Vermonters have themselves identified the areas of need and the opportunity. So I think this is gonna continue that conversation. And it's great on behalf of Senator Lee to be part of this and having Ted Brady as the moderator is a bonus. <laughs> I'm glad one person thinks that. <laughs> well, let's get into the heart of our conversation, which is the talk infrastructure. And I'm going to go, not quite in a reverse order, but I'm going to put John on the spot first. Here's the question for you all. Uh, what 
are the most important infrastructure investments that Vermont should make to realize the Vermont proposition or a Vermont proposition? And how are you and your organization going to make it happen? Well, it's a great question. And, you know, when Senator Lay had the first appropriations hearing this year, it was on infrastructure. And he said, gone are the days when infrastructure has meant only bridges, highways, roads, and rail. And I think one of the most, and a lot of the investments we'll make is about the human infrastructure. In fact, the discussion going on in Washington right now on the President Biden's infrastructure bill is around what is infrastructure. There are those who feel that human investment is not, should not be part of an infrastructure package. So I think investing in the human infrastructure is incredibly important. And all the things we do in the physical infrastructure will enhance people's lives in Vermont, you know, whether broadband in so many ways, educational opportunities, healthcare, economic development, affordable housing, education, job training, childcare, all those things we have identified that we need, we can invest in those. And then, you know, I asked our natural resource field rep, Tom Berry, you know, what should we do on the water side? Because water quality is very important in Vermont. And he said, he said, quickly do the basic pipes and ditches infrastructure, real basic stuff, then shift our focus to green infrastructure, natural infrastructure that reduces the need for pavement and pipes. And on that, you've got hard infrastructure like manure pits, wastewater treatment plants, uh, doing away with combined sewer overflow. And there's the soft things like riparian zones and building ground soils that'll last, low impact development techniques where we use less, less pavement and more pervious services work on water retention and uh, recharging. And the soft infrastructure, the advancements that we as a state have already made in our agricultural water quality practices, take advantage of those, because that's such an important part of our culture, a strong agricultural economy that's been struggling. So investments there. And then, you know, the green economy, you know, and Mary will get into this, but, you know, two-way communications on our electric grid to make sure that we can actually know when we need to produce it, how, what the demand is, how we can react to it. And we, if we can have more locally produced energy that's renewable, that's all the better. You know, the cheapest electricity is the stuff you don't use, you know, so the more we focus on that, the better. And green infrastructure, you know, as we develop things using natural infrastructure, using, again, less pavement, having it to where we invest more in electric vehicles, build that infrastructure for charging stations throughout the state. So there are so many things to take advantage of, but I think we really need folks on the human infrastructure and have the physical infrastructure in place that'll support that. Thanks, John. Uh, just a reminder, I see a couple of questions coming in. Please enter your questions for a panelist, or if you have a thought that you'd like to state with hopefully a question mark near it, do that in the Q&A function. Uh, Mary, John tagged you talking about energy and green infrastructure. It seems like we should probably go to you to talk about what you think we need to do for uh, uh, infrastructure in the Vermont proposition. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and he and he set it up well. I'd say this is a question that um, we've been working on quite a bit at Green Mountain Power. We talk about quite a bit at Green Mountain Power, particularly as it relates to energy. Um, and really in partnership with our customers and many others in the state. But two, two things come to mind uh, for me. First, I'll tell you that the events recently in Texas, the wildfires in California, the uh, Australian wildfires uh, before the pandemic, uh, and even the weather we've seen in Vermont uh, over the last several years really have highlighted the fact that we need to act and much quicker uh, if we are going to meet the threat of climate change and do it in a way that keeps costs down. Um, so Vermont is now one of the cleanest states from an electricity supply perspective, and we need to keep building on that. Uh, GMP is on our path to be 100% renewable by 2030, 100% carbon free by 2025. Um, the transportation and thermal sectors in Vermont remain uh, the largest drivers of greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to focus investments in those areas uh, to help Vermonters make changes uh, in their lives that they can feel good about um, and that can help our state and our economy, frankly, as a whole uh, in Vermont. Um, so as you heard John refer to, as, as an energy industry, generation is now much closer to where it is consumed. Uh, and why this is important is because it means a much more local 
and regional energy delivery system that is green and clean and more resilient in the face of climate change. So the system of old centralized fossil fuel based generation facility transmitting that power uh, through traditional poles and wires to customers far, far away is gone and we have to transfer in Vermont, we very much have. We have to continue to transfer to a system uh, of the future, which is clean, renewable, distributed generation, closer to homes and businesses uh, right here in our local uh, and regional communities. So when you plug in that electric car, when you turn on that heat pump uh, for heating or cooling, um, Vermonters now and Vermonters in the future are gonna expect that supply to be clean. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing, thing uh, builds off that, um, you know, and as we continue to build out distributed generation in Vermont, uh, it is absolutely key uh, that we establish communities of energy resources uh, so we can optimize costs uh, of the system and optimize the use of the clean generation. So a great example of this right now in the state are the many Vermonters and, and uh, many businesses who have solar plus storage. Uh, or they participate in a, in a workplace electric vehicle charging station program, or they participate in uh, uh, Green Mountain Power's Bring Your Own Device program. With storage, for example, our, our customers have the resilience of a backup battery when they need it in the event of unpredictable weather, like the thunderstorms rolling through the state now. Or at other times, we can utilize the stored energy in that battery along with many others to balance out demand on, on, on the greater grid. Another great example of this right now, um, uh, in Panton, Vermont, there's a, there's a one of a kind microgrid uh, right here in the state of Vermont, uh, where we're able to unhook up to 900 customers. That's the best way I can think of it. Unhook 900 customers um, on a circuit there from the larger grid uh, if we need to. And those homes and businesses can run uh, independently on solar and storage while we fix the larger grid. Uh, and at other times we can use that solar and storage uh, to balance out the system for everybody in the state. So we're calling those resiliency zones. We're working with communities throughout Vermont uh, to create more of those. Um, but notably all of what I just talked about requires solid internet connectivity. Um, we simply have to move faster uh, in getting Vermonters connected, and that is for so, so many reasons, um, but one of which is the participation in this orchestra of, of clean energy. Um, you know, many, many, many decades ago uh, in Vermont, we were um, electrifying our state um, and bringing uh, electricity to rural communities. Um, and, and I know this is an analogy that many have used, uh, but here we are now in 2021 and we need to be doing the same thing uh, with respect to, to connectivity and the and internet throughout the state. All right, Mary, I, I don't know if you've already coined that term or if I'm I, just I, out of the loop. The participation in the orchestra of clean energy. There you go. Requires <laughs> broadband. What, a, what right. a neat visualization. So. One of the conductors trying to make uh, that uh, that orchestration occur with broadband has been Laura. Laura, tell us about what you think the, um, the, the most kind of important infrastructure is that we need to build a Vermont proposition. Of course, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm going to say broadband, um, but I really wanna have some appreciation for uh, John Tracy's comments about uh, building community infrastructure and I actually think that that's a key part of what we are doing as a state in terms of building out broadband. Uh, and so, and that's really how we have gotten uh, the, the steam underneath us uh, that has put us in a place where we're able to um, uh, really realize uh, uh, some, some progress with the federal funds that are coming in. So uh, we have for the past two years, uh, more than two years, um, been, uh, we have been working as a state, um, understood at some level that we had deteriorating telecommunications infrastructure and that uh, we needed that, uh, we needed telephone um, infrastructure at a minimum for folks to be able to call for help. Uh, but we knew that our rural communities, we could see it, were being left uh, further and further behind um, uh, in, the, in the global, really, digital revolution. Uh, and 
unable to access uh, government, education, the economy, um, all of these, uh, all of these critical aspects of modern life. And uh, that really takes its toll on rural communities. So uh, we have in Vermont a, um, a wonderful model, uh, a group of uh, towns that came together more than 10 years ago to try and tackle this issue, uh, EC Fiber, a bunch of towns uh, in East, uh, East Central Vermont that uh, came together and decided they were going to solve this broadband, um, this broadband issue. Um, and uh, as things have become more and more urgent uh, across Vermont um, with, our, with our telephone infrastructure prior to the pandemic, uh, we finally got to a point uh, and uh, the administration um, agreed that it's time to really empower Vermonters to, um, to start solving this problem. Um, on their own. We have a regulatory structure, um, a federal regulatory structure in place that has really been prohibitive of solving this problem in our state. Um, states are largely preempted from regulating uh, internet service. And so uh, what uh, EC Fiber and what the state of Vermont started to do uh, two years ago in Act 79 was to empower communities and really to step out of that uh, blocked regulatory stream and to create a different pathway for building uh, critical infrastructure. And um, I think our timing was, um, was really fortuitous uh, given, given what has happened now. Um, frequently in our rural communities, uh, when, when I am out talking with folks who are really wanting to get something done, I will say it's, it's never really the money, <laughs> it's that you don't have a great plan. Uh, and so two years ago, we said to communities, you need to come up with a plan. Tell us how to get to the last mile in your community. Uh, we think there's a great model in these communications union districts like, uh, like EC Fiber, and we're going to give you money to create those plans. And Vermonters have been amazing in pulling that together. It is truly remarkable. Um, uh, almost our entire state, um, our towns are connected to one of nine different uh, communications union districts. And those are run uh, by Vermonters who are determined that they're going to get this done. Uh, and a remarkable group really of uh, folks. Um, and they have uh, amongst these nine, they're on different places. They're in different places uh, in terms of preparedness um, over the last two years. And uh, there are probably about half of them that are uh, maybe a third of them that are ready to actually uh, utilize investments right now. Um, and, you know, we could see uh, the work that has been ongoing for two years. Uh, we could see broadband infrastructure built out um, in places like the Kingdom, uh, Southern Vermont, uh, Central Vermont, more in EC Fiber this fall or spring. And, you know, places like Northwest uh, Vermont, Addison County, uh, Bennington County, uh, we could see them next summer and fall, uh, beginning to get this process going. And uh, it's really, it's really quite remarkable. So uh, the community aspect is the piece for me that uh, makes all of this work. Um, and, uh, and that gives me so much hope uh, for, for getting this done. So uh, I cannot wait until we have uh, that, that we have more built and these, uh, the folks that are in these CUDs, that they are front and center and we are able to celebrate them for the heroes that they are. They are really pulling Vermont into uh, the, uh, the digital revolution, the modern age. So, That's great. Laura, thank you. Uh, you have done a superb job conducting these communities to try to, I love that. I love your, your statement. It's never really the money. It's the lack of a plan. And uh, that's what, what a great message to take away there. So when we talk about it, it's not really the infrastructure, it's the lack of a plan to build the infrastructure that's the real problem. Good one. Uh, Lindsay, I saw you shaking your head a lot there with what uh, Laura was saying. Sorry, Secretary Curley. Uh, what about you? Give us your take on infrastructure and the proposition and how ACCD is helping uh, kind of move us forward or Kim. You're right. Yes, I, I'm hearing what everybody's saying, and I'm feeling like saying, you know, community re revitalization for one billion, Ted. I, I agree with what everybody is saying is that we really need to take a holistic approach um, to different types of infrastructure in order to be successful. 
um, not just in our recovery, but in general, I was uh, listening in earlier on the supporting business creation, workforce and innovation. And one of the panelists said, in order to be innovative, we need to fix the infrastructure. And she was referring to the broadband and the climate and the, and the housing and the childcare. Um, so from, from ACCD's perspective, we have prioritized infrastructure investments in housing, providing permanent housing solutions for Vermont's vulnerable homeless, but also for those young families that wanna move here and take our really great jobs. Um, they need to have uh, affordable housing options. Um, they need to have childcare, they need to have broadband. So um, we really are prioritizing infrastructure investments in a way that will impact local economies and businesses. Um, we're creating a program now that will help businesses and nonprofits complete infrastructure projects in communities where there will be significant economic and job growth. Most of these large projects in our communities, as you know, Ted, have been in some sort of some stage of development for a long time, and they really just are requiring some gap funding to get them over the finish line. So we've never been able to provide this type of grant funding to businesses and nonprofits before. And it's exciting with the American Rescue Plan Act that we are able to do this um, and with the support of the legislature. So we'll be able to help communities grow and businesses stay in Vermont and create new jobs. And again, you know, hopefully really get that message out to people that Vermont is the best place to work and live and raise a family. So um, I, again, I'm, I'm really supportive of, of the human infrastructure and the physical, but really talking about communities. Great, Lindsay. What a, what a big deal. Can you repeat how much money do you have for that community investment program? <laughs> One billion. Oh, for the investment. <laughs> um, for the investment, we actually have 11 uh, million to start. We, we definitely wanted a little bit more than that, but um, the legislature did agree to, to let us take that 11 million and see what we could do with it. It gives us a really great opportunity to pilot this program and, and show what impact we can make. And hopefully when we come back in January, we'll have some really great conversations and move that number up. Great. Well, Lindsay's gonna implement the proposition for us with that money, thank God. And I want you to know, Reva Murphy has uh, asked a question and entered some things in the chat, uh, making sure that we think of childcare specifically. I, I listed those four bullets in the existing proposition, three bullets in the existing proposition that were infrastructure. And Reva's just encouraging us to think about that child care bullet as infrastructure, which just seems like a perfect segue to, to what you were talking about there, Lindsay, and others. Well, hey, I, I have a question for two of you. So it seems like connectivity and resiliency infrastructure uh, seems like the key, whether we're talking about physical or human infrastructure. Uh, and I'd like to go to really Laura and Mary, and uh, we'll, we'll start with Mary. Uh, if everything relies on connectivity, do, do you think this record investment that's come in uh, is enough for our orchestra to play? <laughs> well, um, I think that the investment is incredibly meaningful to ensuring we have a chance. Um, and I certainly hope it results in like incredible acceleration of build out efforts. Um, but I think it will take collaboration among all of us uh, to build off the investments to ensure all Vermonters have access, um, that our efforts are widespread um, and that we don't move too slowly to get it done. I, I liked um, Representative Sibelius' quote there and I think it made me think of one that I've heard before and I don't know who to attribute it to, but it's something along the idea of like ideas are a dime a dozen, but execution is rare. Um, and I think that uh, that will be extremely important um, uh, as we look to utilize this funding and, and more funding hopefully into the future. Uh, and then a collaboration amongst all of us um, that can be meaningful here to ensure it gets done for the state. And then I think too, like, you know, along with along with the funding and the bias towards action, um, I think we got to keep our other initiatives that complement it um, working in parallel. So, uh, you know, really working to ensure Vermonters, while they are getting access to high speed internet, internet, that we're at the same time bringing along the initiatives that will be leveraged by it, like the electric vehicle charging infrastructure, like battery storage programs, um, distributed generation throughout the state. Um, 
I think if we're able to do that right, many of these important programs um, will converge uh, to ensure connectivity and resilience happen at the same time um, and happen, uh, you know, as quickly as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, so those are my thoughts on that one, Ted. Well, that's great, Mary. I, I go back to my kids. My, my, I have a second grader, and my, my, the teacher keeps telling me, realize that we're lear you're learning to read now. Next year, you start reading to learn. It's not enough to teach a kid to read. You need to then teach them how to learn while they're reading. And that's broadband, right? Broadband is teaching us to read. Yep. Then what do we do with that broadband thing? Laura, what about you? Is this enough? You've, you've been such a champion to, to make this happen. Uh, is it enough and then what? Uh, well, we are looking at right now about 250 million, but I think the latest estimates to get this built out were, were probably a billion. Um, 250 million is an amazing, an amazing opportunity to accelerate uh, the work that our communities have been doing. And we, we were not anticipating having those types of resources and Vermonters were digging in anyway. Um, and so uh, the, the good news is that it is enough to get our CUDs um, up and operating under their own steam. Uh, the, the proposition that has been put forward to build out this type of infrastructure is not one that doesn't you know, generate revenue. Uh, you know, there are customers that need this service. They just don't need it. Uh, they, the, the, the CUDs don't need to generate the same level of profit that um, we have seen, which has been prohibitive of getting this investment built out. So um, will it do everything? It will not, but it will, uh, it is going to rapidly accelerate um, our ability to get this, uh, to get these CUDs self-sustaining and generating. Um, I think shortening um, the time, you know, four or five uh, six years um, to getting to the to the end of the road, and um, and uh, broadband is such a critical critical piece of infrastructure to connecting to other systems that need to be modernized. Uh, Mary's been talking about climate change, uh, transportation, uh, you know, all of our systems, um, education, healthcare, everything, you know, as those are uh, modernizing. So. Um, it, it's it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity that we have. Thank you, Representative Sebelia. Uh, let's let's go to John and Lindsay. Here's here's a question for you, John. Uh, let's actually let's go to Lindsay first, just to make John wait. Uh, I what what do you think? I, I don't think that we can win an infrastructure arms race when every state in the country is getting this money. I don't think we can win an infrastructure arms race because it's kind of complicated in a rural area. So what infrastructure investments or how do we put this money to use that really differentiates ourselves from other places? Lindsay? Thanks, Ted. You know, I think Vermont is differentiating ourselves um, already by creating a statewide approach that prioritizes equity in our communities. And that means that even though it will be scaled, there will be investments in nearly every region of our state. Um, rather than investing only in our urban areas, which is probably going to be um, something many states do, we are um, choosing to make sure that we take what we call the 251 approach. And that means we are gonna serve every town and every community and these investments um, in infrastructure will touch upon all of those areas of Vermont. So um, overall, again, you know, feeling like we have continued to say that we care about all of Vermont and we want to make sure that, and as I mentioned earlier, we have shovel-ready projects in every single county in Vermont um, that we hopefully can help move the needle on. And some of these, you know, somebody brought up child care earlier. Some of these are child care centers. Some of these are um, food production. Some of these are, <laughs> they, I, I, I can't even think of all the lists, but there is such a variety of, um, of different projects that have been identified that will be game changers for communities. Could be outdoor recreation opportunities. Um, so I think we really have had an opportunity to do something really special here. John, how about you? How do we differentiate in infrastructure? Well, I think generally speaking, Vermont already has a brand that people relate to. And you've seen it during the COVID pandemic, people actually moving here. <clears throat> and I've always asked people when they move to Vermont, I ask them why. And a lot of it has to do with the quality of life that we have. 
And when you, you know, Richard Florida and the books on the creative economy, Vermont has all those things, the quality of life, institutions of higher education, major medical centers, a very tolerant population, the closeness, the scale that we have. So I don't think we need to compete with anybody else. I just think we need to build on what we have. And I think part of that is we don't necessarily have to go back to doing things the way we used to do them either. I think the pandemic has really enlightened a lot of us to that work-life balance. You know, one of our staffers in DC said, you know, if we hadn't been a pandemic, I would not have seen my son take his first steps. But because he was working remotely, he could. And, you know, you're not having that drive time. So there's a lot we can do there. And this is my own personal thing. I always thought, you know how good everybody feels when you have a three-day weekend? You know, you actually had time to do stuff and hang out with your family. You know, why not go to a four-day work week or continue the teleworking? There's a lot there. And in Vermont, Senator Leahy brings up, as chair of appropriations and vice chair prior to this, he brings staffers from subcommittees to Vermont. And on more than one occasion, they commented that Vermonters come to the table and actually work together. They don't elbow each other out to get talking time. They actually work together. And they do this all over the country. So we have that ability to work together. Let's um, build on what we have. And there's an opportunity to recalibrate the way we do things. So I don't think we need to race against anybody else. Just build on the brand that we have and use this investment wisely. That's good. I, I like the uh, equity approach, Lindsay, and I like the fact that John's encouraging us to do what we do best, which is be Vermont. Be Vermonty. And John, I, I feel like I missed a really big, important piece of news. Did I hear you say that you got to see your son's first steps? I assume he clarified grandson, but maybe maybe not. It was my one of the staffers in D.C., who was on Tim Reeser's committee, was able to see his son take his first steps. Oh, that's great. Uh, Very uh, neat. So I'm going to call an audible for our panel here. We have a lot of questions, uh, and we have about 40 minutes left. And I'm going to go into some of these questions because they build on the conversation we're having, and then maybe come back to the last question that I kind of queued up for you all, which I, I want to go uh, back south down by Laura, one of Laura's neighbors. Uh, uh, Tim Arsenal has asked a question about, uh, and this goes to you, Mary, maybe others have some thoughts on this, but what can the state's electric utilities, and you alluded to this, Mary, so I just want to have a more explicit answer. What can you do and what can Green Mountain Power and others do to leverage that infrastructure into additional broadband internet coverage for the state? Well, um, we have uh, thought a lot about this and we actually partnered with Vermont Electric Co-op um, uh, recently to uh, do something as quickly as we could uh, we, uh, to get a program out for um, internet service providers uh, and others to have access to our polls basically all throughout the state um, and to do it in a way that uh, would help keep costs down. So we did a, a what we call make ready work. Make ready work is just a fancy term for uh, to put to put new cables on our poles, we need to sometimes go out and uh, get them ready for that, make them bigger, move move equipment that's already on the poles around. So it requires a little bit of work from our crews or contractors. And so uh, we thought if we could move quickly and come up with a incentive uh, for folks throughout Vermont to get to uh, particularly the parts of our state uh, where connectivity is the worst, uh, that we ought to be doing that. Um, and so we partnered with VEC uh, to roll out that program. And, and we've, we've been working, our team has been working uh, with CUDS and some others to, to get going on that. And we're hoping that that's successful. Um, and on top of that, you know, to the extent we, GMP or other um, uh, utilities in the state uh, have communication facilities to our infrastructure, uh, that we could make available, we ought to think, we, we, we think we should do that too. So think about how uh, Green Mountain Power might have um, uh, fiber uh, to uh, one of our substations or some critical infrastructure throughout the state in order to communicate with it. Um, if to the extent that we have availability in that fiber, or we could do something different there to um, offer that to Vermonters uh, and to the internet service providers, we ought to be doing that as well. Um, so those are, those are two things that come to mind for me uh, as you look around the state and you see existing infrastructure, we, we should be leveraging it um, as best we can, uh, particularly in rural parts of the state um, where, you know, bringing infrastructure out is expensive. We ought to be leveraging it and uh, we're here to do the best we can to collaborate on that. 
Oh, thanks, Mary. What an incredible thing to have an electric utility proactively thinking about broadband. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Sebelia, I know your committee has taken a lot of testimony. And just so you know, we have Representative uh, Inchaka uh, in our audience today, and I know he has heard much testimony on this topic. Do you have any thoughts on electric utilities and their role in this? Well, I think that, um, you know, Mary has done a great job kind of talking about what GMP and uh, um, Vermont Electric have done. Uh, Washington Electric um, is another um, co-op that is looking to partner directly with the CUD in a different, uh, in a different way and help, um, help uh, uh, get lines built out. We worked with them um, uh, this year as part of the legislation that was recently passed, H360, to make sure that um, they were not penalized for doing that and their, um, and their, their rate payers were not penalized for doing that. Um, and and I would just I would just say uh, you know the uh, oh, it was Tim that asked this question um, you know it's a great question and uh, this what we have been building and kind of trying to stand up at a state at a statewide scale um, the utilities uh, and uh, the transmission uh, utility in Vermont have been key key. Um, thought partners and support systems, not only for legislators, but for um, the CUDs, you know, really investing uh, countless hours in helping folks understand that is not going to work, uh, or perhaps this is a better way of thinking about this. And so uh, we, we, I don't think would be actually where we are right now, had, were it not for the work that the utilities have already invested. So Team Vermont. Team. Thanks, Laura. I think Representative Yanchaka is enjoying this role where he gets to ask you questions, Laura, because he has a lot, but I'm going to skip him for a second. And I'm going to go to Mike uh, Kais, uh, and please forgive me if I mispronounce your name, Mike, from Vital Communities. And Lindsay, I want to throw this one to start to you, which is, uh, you know, how to involve towns and individuals of all capabilities in the investments we're talking about, because it feels like we need lots of locally appropriate experiments as part of this orchestra. Some experiments won't be the right idea in the right place or time, but uh, he thinks we can collectively learn from them all if we are very conscious of making sure we do this everywhere. Any thoughts on that? I know you mentioned it in your earlier comments. Yeah, I would just say, you know, make sure that your ideas and your thoughts are shared with local planners, whether it's your regional development corporations or regional, regional planning commissions. Um, you know, we really do wanna make sure that these projects are, um, going to broadly help the community. And, you know, we know that some things will be more important to some than others, but um, overall, if, if you can take a community approach to putting something forth, um, that's really helpful. Again, we're very, um, we were very uh, much in contact with the regional development corporations, the regional planning commissions, and understanding what some of the long-term objectives have been for the communities around the state. So. I would say um, that's one er one approach you could take. The other thing is, um, I think that anybody that knows me would tell you I have a very open door policy. I'm happy to hear from you directly and try to direct those conversations to the right people within the communities as well. So um, I really do appreciate the interest. Um, I think that we all will be better off if people put, put their heads together and figure out what is the best investment for your community right now. And Ted, if I could do a shameless plug, the Community Resource Guide put out by VCRD is a great resource for people who want to get involved in what's going on in your local community, how to bring things together. So. That's a good plug at a VCRD event. I like it. Paul will like that. <laughs> so, and Ted, I'll just add to that just quickly. Um, we've been, uh, the team here at GMP has been really focused on getting out to parts of our state, rural parts of our state and talking to towns and communities about resiliency because, you know, there's no, we find that um, the folks that know best what to do are the ones that are suffering from the problems. And so we've, we've been spending a lot of time in towns and communities at energy committee meetings and other things. And uh, we have a whole team of people here that um, are just wanting to talk to Vermonters. So call us. Um, don't please don't ever hesitate to call us uh, on the energy side at least um, if you have any ideas or you want to um, suggest something or you want to learn what's happening somewhere else in the state so it's just a ploy to call us if you want call your utility for goodness sakes <laughs> hey this is a 
choose your own adventure ride, folks. So you out there in Zoom land, and I'm looking at you, Trish Sears, I'm looking uh, at, at you, Michael Monty, I'm looking at you, Mark Foley. I want to see questions from you for our panel. This is your chance to grill them. But here's one that kind of builds uh, on that equity issue uh, or on John's comments about really retaining that Vermontiness when we do this, and that's how we differentiate ourselves. Uh, Representative Vianchaka asked a great question, which is, you know, thinking about what kind of businesses you want to re re attract and building economies in places like Springfield and St. Johnsbury, what infrastructure do we need to, to make them come to Vermont? And this, I think, is the key question. How do we build that infrastructure and retain the characteristic rural nature of Vermont as we nurture that growth? And, and I'm going to look to Laura and Lindsay to answer this first, and then if John and Mary have comments, maybe go, go from there. Probably should start with Lindsay, seeing how she is the Secretary of Commerce. <laughs> Um, I mean, this is really great. Again, I go back to this whole point about, um, you know, we have to we have to make sure that there are things in place to enable us to get innovative and bring people here. And, um, you know, recently I was was touring a, a very uh, cutting edge company here in Vermont. And, you know, they're struggling finding housing. Right. So they they're ready to bring a lot of people on board, but they need housing for their employees. Um, we talked earlier about childcare. So um, again, I think that we just have to be really focused on making sure that we build that infrastructure now so that we can, um, we can uh, get really great companies here. So there's a variety of jobs. Uh, it's, it's not enough to have one great company. We have to have lots. There has to be choices. When people move here, they generally want op opportunity, other opportunities as well. Um, I do know uh, recently uh, an acquaintance of mine talked about starting a, a business in Vermont and the attraction for him was really the Vermont brand that we talked about earlier. But also what was really, really attractive to him was the fact that we had companies like Data Technologies and Dealer.com and some very, very high tech cutting edge companies where they can share resources. Some would say poach employees, but they're, they're moving around and that expertise is drawing people to, to our state. And uh, so again, we need to be ready for that. We need to make sure our infrastructure is there to accept uh, those companies and the people that wanna be here. Yeah, I, I guess uh, I, would, um, I would jump out of my broadband space and say, um, you know, thinking about, um, thinking about our rural communities and, you know, Vermont's incredible brand and, I mean, food, food products, specialty foods. Um, uh, one of the things that's really, really critical for that, which is, which is a, a, a part of our economy that can be really dispersed throughout our state, but water, wastewater, um, that infrastructure, and um, that is key key, key, you know, uh, making sure that we have access to clean water and um, systems that, um, that can dispose um, uh, responsibly. So um, I think those, uh, we certainly have a number of programs, um, I think that, that are coming in um, to help support and build out um, more uh, water and wastewater. I don't know that we're actually spending a lot of time talking about it today, but but there, there are a lot of programs uh, that are coming online, I believe, for that, so. Ted, would, would you mind if I jump onto that too? <laughs> I'm really glad, Representative, that you brought up the wastewater because um, that is a really critical component for all of us as we've traveled around the state. You know, we're hearing that that is the, that is the, the thing that is getting in the way of building out this, this very infrastructure we, that we've talked about, the housing and the childcare and whatnot. And, some of you may have seen Secretary Moore's op-ed not too long ago where she said, if we want to revitalize vacant village centers and encourage development, compact development and expand available and affordable housing and high quality childcare and the growing climate crisis, we literally need to look underground. You know, literally our wastewater systems are preventing us from doing a lot of that build out. So as you mentioned, it's really great again, we have some money to put toward those investments and hopefully we can, can lift this. And Ted, I would suggest, Mary had mentioned using existing infrastructure. There's a lot of infrastructure that exists within Vermont towns. And for the state, we've been talking a long time about redeveloping our downtowns. Yet you continue to see stuff being built 
going out. So it sometimes entails more around permitting and costs, whatever we do to address that, but building on that infrastructure, what we have, and again, broadband is just key to, to, to everything. We just need to have the broadband. So there are some uh, comments in the chat, just uh, so folks know the comments, great, keep it going in the chat, but the questions are where we're driving this conversation. So if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function of Zoom and uh, we'll dive right into that. Uh, the water and wastewater thing is an interesting question for the proposition. I, I think it's I think it's there, but it's not explicitly there. So when you talk about clean water, and uh, that's that's right, that references drinking water and wastewater systems. But uh, you, you can't do anything in the childcare space without drinking water, as Reva's pointing out. You can't do anything in the brewery space if you don't have uh, wastewater. And I, I think the question that Representative Anchaka was getting to earlier was, um, how do you do this in a way that doesn't that doesn't create sprawl, doesn't uh, change the character of these communities, uh, which I, I think many of you have have mentioned. I, I want to go to Mary with uh, another question, uh, which is about transmission capacity uh, and a question about uh, you know so much of the orchestra we talked about and distributed energy generation is constrained by a lack of transmission capacity. And the question is just, what's, what's the path to improve this piece of infrastructure and does it fit in this Vermont proposition conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a, a few thoughts there. Um, first, there is um, no doubt um, upgrades to the existing system that we need to make to accommodate uh, this orchestra or to accommodate um, the, the massive shift from a one-way system to a two-way system and generation being closer to where it's consumed. Um, and so there are, uh, we're advocating now uh, and working with MINI and Team Vermont, uh, other utilities and, and the renewable energy community and others uh, to work with our federal delegation to um, consider significant federal funding all over the country, frankly, but, but here in Vermont uh, to help with that issue. So uh, there is there is some need to upgrade, but uh, I would also suggest um, that we need to uh, innovate around our system and not necessarily turn uh, to poles and wires as the solution um, for everything we do. Uh, and so we very much believe that not only do we need upgrades to the existing infrastructure, but uh, to not miss important opportunities to bring uh, storage and other capacities to areas that need uh, that need it, uh, and uh, to some of our other conversation about building out rural communities, the best thing you can do in a transmission constrained place is to bring more load, uh, which means get more uh, folks off fossil fuels, get them electrifying and plugging into the clean grid and participating in the orchestra of the greater grid. Uh, electric vehicles, um, uh, thermal heating opportunities in uh, the electrical space, uh, and get folks uh, using storage. I'd love to see every uh, Vermont home uh, have a battery uh, in the near future and to have that resilience. Uh, and those are really the best uh, in addition to some of the upgrades to our infrastructure, those to us are really the more important and longer term investments we need to make. I'd, I'll open that up to anybody else. It seems like Mary might be the subject matter expert on that one, but does anybody <laughs> want to add to that? Those people All don't right. want to touch the transmission, yeah. <laughs> How about this uh, from Kathy Lavoie up in the great Northwest Kingdom of uh, Franklin County. Uh, and she writes, uh, the lack of affordable housing at all levels is a primary force in the state. Uh, it's determining all levels of business and workforce. Despite organized focus at state and regional levels, the housing stock doesn't seem to change enough. What, what are we getting wrong? Uh, Lindsay, I hate to do it to you, but again, this seems like it might be in your wheelhouse. Yeah, you know, we we proposed $250 million in investments in housing. And there was definitely um, a lot of uh, support for housing for the most vulnerable. Sorry, we're having quite a storm here, I'm not clear. Um, but some of the, the housing proposals 
related to um, fixing up rundown stock and bringing that back online for um, sort of that that missing middle we call didn't didn't necessarily make it over the finish line uh, this time. Again, I'm really really hopeful that we can take some of these these small wins and come back in January and have a really great conversation with the legislature. Um, but Kathy, I really appreciate you raising that. We're hearing it, you know, all around the state that we, you know, we really need to focus on all housing. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I hope, I know you're talking about it, Kathy, but I hope others are really talking about it around the state because we need to bring attention to it and, and get that, get more housing online. It's going to continue to be really hard to recruit. And didn't the recently passed budget have 190 million for affordable housing, I think, in the state? And of that, money's for weatherization too, because we have programs, national programs, and the state participates in LIHEAP as well. But if we actually do a better job of weatherizing existing homes, that'll save money from the bigger bucket eventually. But yeah, you hear about it everywhere. That and job training. And I would add that, uh, you know, a, a, a residence without, that isn't connected, uh, nobody wants to live there. And, uh, you know, we have a number of rural towns who have a significant part of their, um, their residential homes that don't have adequate broadband or cell service. And so I expect that, that getting us connected can help just in and of itself to alleviate some pretty significant pressure. Well said, Lori. Well said, Lindsay. Thanks, John. Uh, no other questions in the Q&A. I will give a chance at the end to go back to a final question, but I want to go to uh, really our final question here to the four panelists, which this has been talked about already, but I think it's worth kind of putting, wrapping it in a bow for the, the, prop, for, for the proposition uh, considerations that are being done, which is uh, is there some definition or type of infrastructure that we're forgetting? We talked about social infrastructure and community infrastructure. We talked about water and wastewater. Uh, or is there a different definition as John, I think, started us off talking about press, you know, the, the conversation in DC about what infrastructure is. Um, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts there? And uh, this won't be our final one because there's a couple more uh, questions coming in. But uh, why don't we start with, uh, with Mary? Sorry, I was having a little mouse trouble there. Um, uh, you know, in when I first thought about this question, um, you know, early childhood education came to mind for me and thinking in terms of um, the disproportionate impact that the pandemic has had on uh, women and our BIPOC communities. Um, and so, you know, I thought, as we think about connectivity and we and we think about battling climate change and and we've got to be thinking about those folks in particular and how our programs and um, our rollouts to solve these problems uh, really um, elevate communities that have struggled in particular through um, the past year and a half, which frankly has been. Um, really devastating for many, many people around the country and um, many people in Vermont. Um, and then as we talked today, I also feel like there's, we've, we've got us the, 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 the housing crisis and the, and the water um, crisis in Vermont as well, uh, I think are important challenges for us to really be prioritizing as a part of thinking about our future and, and how to make ourselves um, more connected and more resilient. How about you, Laura? So uh, in thinking about this, um, one thing that actually really concerns me that I don't think we are thinking about nearly enough, and it's really connected to broadband, uh, you know, broadband allows us to access uh, the rest of the world, um, but it also allows the rest of the world to access us. And uh, things like um, cybersecurity um, and privacy, um, I'm actually really concerned that, um, that Vermont does not have, um, like most states actually, so I don't want to imply that Vermont is further behind than other places, but 
uh, we, we don't have uh, adequate infrastructure in place, both human and knowledge um, and, and um, you know, uh, systems checks to, to make sure that those safeties are in um, as we are expanding our access to the rest of the world. Um, I think really um, key for us and uh, something that actually Vermont in our Vermont scale and uh, you know Vermont capable population willing to take on anything you know I would count on us to be able to uh, to to address that but you know I think we need to we need to start moving that ball as we build more there's always something else to worry about so great point that was a that was a good catch Lindsay any anything that we're missing here. I don't know. Uh, you know, I just, I, I think that we do continue to set ourselves apart. You know, we have defined infrastructure differently. Um, we know that, you know, as John said, there are maybe conversations in Washington that are different, but about the definition of, an, of infrastructure, but here in Vermont, we are focusing on people and places and things and making investments that strengthen our labor force infrastructure, you know, through training programs and other workforce development opportunities. Um, we're making investments in childcare, which is arguably the single most important investment we can make for working families in Vermont. And we're investing in physical infrastructure. Um, we're being guided by this long held philosophy in Vermont that our people matter and our communities and our businesses matter. And of course our roads and bridges and connectivity matters. Um, so I, I really do think that this will continue to, to set us apart. Um, so, so in the in the plan, maybe there's something that that may seemingly be missing, but I, I think we do have our eye on the eye on the ball here, and maybe it's just making sure that these things that we've talked about today are all in there in some form. John, well, the Vermont proposition is a work in progress. It's been going on for years. It stepped up recently, and uh, with the COVID pandemic coming on. It's changed things. And I think we have an opportunity to change our routine, how we do everything. And I think <clears throat> it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't take advantage of that. The work-life balance, the teleworking. You know, there was a period in time where a lot of young Vermont males were getting incarcerated. And there was, you know, you have at latchkey kids, all this. Do we have an opportunity to reprogram the way people conduct their lives? The days in the work week, the hours in the work day, teleworking. And I think the more time Vermonters can spend with their families, the better we're all going to be. So should, we should really take this opportunity to re-engineer the way we run our lives, both our, you know, work and family time. I like it, John. I, I want to go to two last questions, and then I'm going to come back to the panel and, and just ask for a 15 to 30 second response on a final closing question in a couple of minutes, which is, uh, you know, what what do you think needs to be included in the proposition that isn't? And just be noodling on that while we, I'm gonna to go to a couple more questions here. There's some great chat activity happening in the chat. Be sure you read through that. And uh, I also wanna point out that Mike from Vital Communities is just pointing out that the Keys to the Valley is a great resource for folks, keystothevalley.com uh, on some housing uh, recommendations. And I, uh, Mary, I hate to put you on the spot again for a real specific question, but a, a, question, mm -hmm. a question from Patricia, Trish Sears, uh, that in Lowell, they're curious how they can leverage the assets of the Lowell wind farm, i.e. Uh, they can see the fiber strung on poles on Route 100 to bring robust fiber to the last mile uh, for a high-speed broadband service. Uh, that's a specific thing, but if you say yes to energy infrastructure, what are we saying no to? Or perhaps what are the things should we be thinking to leverage that energy infrastructure? Yeah, no, those, that's exactly what, um, uh, that was a more succinct and specific way of saying what I was uh, attempting to say earlier about our make ready uh, and utilizing our existing infrastructure where we can um, to bring broadband to the last mile. So how we think about it in our industry is we refer to the mid mile and the last mile and, um, you know, we have, and Velco, our transmission provider here in Vermont and others um, uh, may have fiber opportunities like the one she refers to um, in the mid mile, uh, and then building from there to the last mile and getting uh, fiber uh, and connectivity to customers that are particularly rural. Um, and that's what we're working on with our make ready uh, work we've been doing. 
Um, and we're, that, that's exactly, I think, the work we have to focus on with internet service providers, uh, utilize the existing infrastructure we have in the state um, and GMP, VEC, and as Representative uh, Sebelia pointed out, Washington Electric as well, uh, I really think are um, all in on, on this. And I feel very grateful for being able to work with uh, a team of leaders um, around the state in, at our electric utilities and otherwise um, who really feel like it's uh, it, that we could help this and, and we should do everything we can to help. Um, so those are exactly the right questions to be asking as you drive around and you look at the existing infrastructure and those are exactly the ways we're trying to help. Laura, is there something you'd like to add to that one? I know your committee's taking a lot of time talking about this type of stuff. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that we are, I think that Vermonters should know that, um, you know, there are hundreds of their um, neighbors working together uh, with our utilities, with legislators, with the governor's administration um, to, to uh, the, a lot of the planning is done. Uh, and so now, you know, trying to work with our private internet service providers and telephone companies to build out, um, Tremendous amount of resources have come in. We're gonna see some competition uh, for, for actually um, assets to build um, across the country because this is of course a problem across the country. So the bodies and the trucks and the, and the wire. But Vermonters should expect that, um, you know, we're gonna see whole towns being built out if this model works and we believe that this model does work. We have um, a, a functioning model in EC Fiber. Uh, and so, for instance, in my neck of the woods, we have uh, we have 20 towns that are part of a CUD, and we have uh, six of them that are um, that are slated for building out their unserved and underserved addresses. Um, you know, this fall and spring, and that's that's how this pattern will kind of build out. Um, we think mostly throughout um, throughout the state. So. Really, and, and it'll be different partners coming. You know, you may see utilities, you may see internet service providers. Um, working with uh, working with some existing infrastructure um, and and building new infrastructure. So, thanks. I'm going to go to our last question before I do our final wrap up. But before I do that, I need to point out that we have Vermont Proposition Royalty in this session, which is Buzz Schmidt from the Retreat Farm. And I'm not kidding when I say this is all Buzz's fault. Buzz planted this seed with VCRD more than two years ago that said it is time for us to define what we want Vermont to be and to tell people around the world what Vermont wants to be so that they can come and be part of it. And that's what I distill, distill the Vermont proposition down to. So thank you, Buzz. And you are uncharacteristically quiet in the chat and the questions. So next time I give you grief for saying too much at a board meeting, bring this up. Our last question, and I'm going to kick it over to John and to Lindsay. Um, the question about traveling infrastructure, and I assume this question is really saying roads, bridges, those things are important, in part because without them, you can't service the broadband infrastructure that we're talking about, and we don't attract people here if you can't get here. So before they can use the broadband, they need to be able to drive here or get a train here or take a plane here. So what are your thoughts on just the relationship between the Vermont proposition and transportation infrastructure? John, I'll go to you and then to Lindsay. No, I think we need to be cognizant that there are areas of the state where getting to them, they're beautiful once you get there, but it's, you got to want to go there to get there. So we need to make those investments sensitive to the environmental impacts that it has. You know, there's, you got an interstate running up one side of the state, but not on the other. And you know, it's route seven, they, it's like a, a boa constrictor widens and narrows like it's digesting something they keep making. I drive that road a lot. So I think we have to make sure that's in place, but we need to invest in public transportation. And I know it's even harder in a rural environment, but more electric vehicles, more electric vehicle charging stations, uh, more fuel efficiency. But in order to make sure that it's sensitive to the communities that it goes through, you know, we've paved a lot and there's a notice, uh, one of the things on the national level, how much money people spend every year repairing their motor vehicles due to damage caused by roads that are in bad shape. You know, so there's an impact to the consumer there. So as long as it's sensitive to the needs of the community, make those roads travelable so people can get there to enjoy the broadband once it gets there. But again, that's, you know, there's state and federal money involved in that. And there's also part of this local and state planning process for what the community wants. And that's incredibly important. And any type of 
natural um, infrastructure we couldn't put in place to eradicate or cut down on the runoff from paved roads. Same thing goes for shopping centers, schools, hospitals. We've got to reduce the runoff we have from those surfaces. So as long as we can incorporate green technology into that construction, that'll be better. And you're seeing bike lanes everywhere as well. So there's multimodal that we need to embrace in all parts of the state. Thanks, John. Lindsay, anything you'd like to add on that? I think he hit it really well. I mean, I do think, you know, he made a good point, right? Electronic pul propulsion, you know, and vehicles or aircraft and whatnot is, is the wave of the future. And so, um, you know, I know, again, we, we've talked about beta technologies. They have an interest in um, utilizing our most rural airports and, and um, you know, bringing, bringing more connectivity through their products to, to those uh, airports around the state which, you know, hopefully at some point we can broaden that to turn into some tourism opportunities as well. But I, I really don't have a lot more to add than what, what John said. I, I think um, I was kind of going back to the proposition and trying to figure out if that was really in there. And I'm not sure if it is. So maybe that's, that's another area where we can, can tweak it a bit and, and edit it. But I, I may be just missing it. I'm looking at the, the skinny version, the straw man version. So. Well, I think there's just a real push and pull here. You know, everything can't be in the Vermont proposition. Then it's not the Vermont proposition. It's the proposition for civilization. And so it's an interesting question. How, how, we're, how does transportation fit into the Vermont proposition? And John, you're kind of defining a vision for what our transportation network and infrastructure should look like that might differentiate ourselves from other places. And to your point, Lindsay, uh, putting the money in the right place might benefit the key part of our economy in the tourism and rec sector. Let, let's wrap it up with this question. Each of you, less than 30 seconds. Uh, what's what's missing from the proposition on infrastructure, or what would you what, what would you like to influence uh, the proposition when it comes to infrastructure? Mary, fire away. I saw you come off mute. I did because I actually think Representative Sibilia said something extremely important earlier. Um, uh, with respect to, she said many really important things, but one of which was re, uh, with respect to cyber security. Um, I do think as you look across things that have happened, not only in Vermont, but across our country uh, related to cyber issues, it, it, uh, as we work on these things to better ourselves, there are people out there uh, that are unfortunately trying to take it down. And I think that's a very important piece of this conversation. We're gonna follow the bouncing ball. And I think Mary bounced it to Laura by mentioning you. So Laura, what's missing? You know, I, cyber, um, you know, for sure. Uh, and and just uh, that that's, that's a lot, you know, uh, just even our folks understanding how to protect themselves, regular citizens, businesses, government, um, institutions, our utilities, our critical infrastructure. Um, so sorry um, to steal that one from you, Representative, but that's that's okay. <laughs> Keep me on my toes, Mary. It's so Keep me important. On my toes. It's so I think, important. I, I think when it gets repeated, it just shows how we're yeah. able to wrap something up in a meeting like this. It says, boy, that was a really important takeaway. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay, anything missing that you'd like to see in the proposition? Um, as I mentioned, you know, I think community revitalization is enormous. And so um, if I had to pick one thing, maybe it's the wastewater, mm -hmm. such as touches a lot there, but again, stealing that from Representative Sebelia. <laughs> John, do you want to steal something from Representative Sebelia? Yes, I will. But I should, I forgot to mention rail. If you travel throughout Vermont, you'll see there's been oh, yeah. a lot of improvement in the rail beds throughout the state to increase passenger rail. And there used to be a lot of them here. So we can work on that. Now, I was going to mention maybe a hard reference to the wastewater, because we talk about water quality as it relates to the working landscape but there also is a working landscape that is our downtowns and you know we did a community visit like the Montgomery and they couldn't do any more economic development without having without having some sort of storm uh, sewer or wastewater treatment so I would just maybe we need to reference that a little bit more because that'll allow growth and jobs and if we focus it on the downtowns that much better. Well, thanks, John. Thanks to this panel. This has been an amazing hour and 15 minutes with some incredibly smart leaders in the state. So thank you for all you do for Vermont. Thank you for giving the hour and 15 minutes today. And thank you to the uh, viewers and the participants today. Uh, the, I wish you could all see the incredible list of 
uh, attendees who are as qualified or not more so than us, the five of us to talk about this issue. So thanks for listening and thanks for participating. A quick reminder, uh, all of these panels that you may have missed will be on uh, recording and you'll be able to view them. And also five o'clock social hour today uh, using the, the uh, platform we have today and a 7 p.m. optional uh, uh, proposition conversation at the end of the day too. Otherwise, thanks everybody. Have a great day. Avoid great the Great job, Ted. <laughs> thanks. That's very nice. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Ted.